Shinomo Bay. President Trump making good on a campaign promise there to keep Gitmo open. The commander in chief also raising the prospect of sending new prisoners there, a move supported by Senator James Inhofe, who writes, one of the best, most effective counterterrorism tools is maintaining our facilities at Guantanamo Bay. President Trump made the right call to keep the detention center open for the safety of American families. Senator Inhofe joins us now. He's the Oklahoma Republican who sits on the Armed Services Committee as well. It's my understanding that President Trump signed the executive order just before delivering the State of the Union address. Uh, did your office get a heads up on that? Yeah, we did. And John, you know, uh, it's just it's just shocking that we had a president in Obama who'd want to get this thing to shut it. There's no place else we can put these guys. I was really pleased when Trump first came out and acknowledged that they are enemy combatants. These are not criminals. These are not uh, uh, the, the type of people that you should intermingle with the terrorists. You've the job of a terrorist is to train other people to be terrorists. So you can't put them in our prisons. Well, the first thing that the uh, uh, that President Obama tried to do was to close Close Gitmo. The only justification that they could say is almost like we don't want to offend the the, the, the terrorists. Well, they're going to try to kill us anyway. So he made every effort that a president could make to close Gitmo. We kept it open in the Senate Armed Services Committee, and so what he did is just let them loose, and they ended up. Uh, some the estimate is about 30 percent of them went back and returned to the battlefield. And I know that uh, the Washington Post documented that there were six Americans that were killed by those who had actually were released from Gitmo. Look, Gitmo is a place where they're treated properly. It's a great interrogation place. They don't use torture and all that stuff. They eat good. They have better medical conditions than they ever had before. Yeah. It's just outrageous that thing isn't operating. I'm really glad that he's he's doing it. One of the 41 prisoners still housed there is Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the guy who planned the 9-11 attacks. Uh, how would you propose to get rid of or, you know, deal with a Khalid Sheikh Mohammed if you didn't have a Gitmo to keep him. No, no, John, there is no place you could put him. Now, I've, I've seen him several times in my visits down to Gitmo. And, uh, you know, there, there, is, there are other choices. They could be, he could be wiped out or something, and then people would really be screaming. There's still possibility to get information from him, but you said it. You nailed it. Here's the guy that was responsible for putting together 9-11, and what else would he do with him? They actually tried. Uh, Obama tried to use, uh, in my state of Oklahoma, uh, uh, down in, in Lawton, Oklahoma, one of our military establishments has a little prison there. He wanted to put some of them in there, and we were able to stop that. But his result was he turned them loose. <laughs> He turned him back to overseas. So I was just really proud. First of all, it's a great speech that Trump made last night. He made me proud, and he, he touched on all the right things that I'm interested in, uh, rebuilding our defense and uh, infrastructure. It's, uh, and I was so glad that he included uh, uh, Gitmo in his presentation. Some of the president's critics have said he is racist to keep Gitmo open. now. That if you pick somebody up on the battlefield who's trying to kill Americans or kill American troops, why is it racist to incarcerate them in a prison on a U.S. naval base in Cuba? There, there's just no justification. I think they get to the point where they have to say something. They've painted themselves in a corner saying, we don't like Gitmo. Well, the whole re original reason for that was they thought that there was, uh, they uh, were accused of using uh, torture, using some things that uh, we would all agree they shouldn't be using. But what has come out of Gitmo is information that has saved countless American lives. Uh, I can re right now, they're down to 41 people in Gitmo. I can remember when it was almost 800 people in Gitmo, and we were able to get a lot of help in, uh, in our battlefield help. And we, we want to go back to that. Oklahoma Senator uh, James Inhofe, a Republican and the guy who's been to Gitmo four times. We appreciate your insights this morning. Thanks Thank for you, coming John. U.S. Coast Guard to the rescue of my 2008 campaign, keep his job despite his inappropriate workplace behavior. The short answer is this. If I had it to do again, I wouldn't.
Hugo Gurdon is the editorial director of the Washington Examiner. Let me ask you first about the timing. What do you think about her putting out this long, long statement right before the State of the Union last night? Well, it was typically cynical. Uh, the truth is that both the content and the timing was cynical. It was a way of putting something out and it looked like it was very expansive, it was, it was very explanatory and it was lengthy, but putting it out immediately before the president was about to make the, his uh, State of the Union speech meant that it, would, uh, it was a clear attempt to avoid having people looking at it closely. The truth is that Hillary Clinton's efforts uh, it's far too late for her to give the impression of being candid and frank about things. Everything is calculated. You know, the toothpaste is already out of the tube. Yeah. She can't put it back, and every time she does, she makes a mess of it. The, it here's the part that really struck me, because it was, it's a very long passage, but she says at this one part, um, I did this because I didn't think firing him was the best solution to the problem. He needed to be punished, change his behavior, and understand why his actions were wrong. The young woman needed to be able to thrive and feel safe. I thought both could happen without him losing his job. She goes on to talk about second chances, but this idea that she didn't want him to lose his job you know, this is the problem that, that a lot of people have right now in this time where we're, we're looking at sexual harassment is they want someone punished, but they don't want their workplace disrupted. They don't yeah. want to themselves be inconvenienced. And well, it, that's it, what this means to me. What do you think? It, 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 that's exactly right, Melissa. She, uh, Hillary Clinton did not want this to come out publicly. She couldn't do nothing. She had to punish him. But the last thing she wanted uh, in the 2008 campaign was a sexual harassment scandal. You know, th her instincts throughout 30 years in public, pol uh, public life have been to keep things secret whenever possible. She claims to be, in this lengthy statement, a lifelong, career-long champion for women's issues. But throughout her career, when it has been more convenient to suppress information yeah. about sexual harassment, she's done so. Notoriously, of course, with her husband, she tried to un erode the credibility and undermine women who accused right. her husband of sexual assault and even rape. So when it's convenient for her, she hides it, and yet she pretends in this this statement yeah. to be a sort of principal champion of women's issues. That's the other big problem with this, is that she, by her past actions, has seemed to not be sympathetic to victims, but to blame them. And this was, you know, it seemed to be more evidence of doing the same thing, of not being sympathetic to the victim, not being on the side of the victim. I know she says in other places in this passage that the victim says she felt supported. But to a lot of women like myself, this seems like more evidence to the contrary. Does it matter now, though? I mean, she's kind of out of public life, although she says in here that she has a lot left to contribute and she's not going away. Well, you know, she clearly can't bear to be outside the public eye. She wants to be in the spotlight. She was at, at the Grammy Awards just the other night. And that was another example of her compromising her principles uh, on sexual harassment and, and uh, uh, you know, women's issues. She read from the book Fire and Fury. That was a book in which Nikki Haley, the U yeah. America's ambassador to the United Nations, was implied to be having an, a, an affair with the president and sleeping her way into the, into the job that she had. There's no evidence for that in the book. You know, if yeah. Hillary Clinton were actually a principled uh, opponent of sexual harassment, she would not have given credence to that book. Yeah. All right. Hugh Gurdon, thanks for joining us. We appreciate your time and analysis. Thanks very much for having me. John. Interesting. You know, she said if she had it to do over again, she wouldn't set up the, the private server You're either. right. Thank you for reminding so me. That's Let's release the number. Oh, yeah. Oh, don't worry. 100%. <laughs> Ohio Congressman Mike Turner joins me now. Congressman, you're a member of the House Intelligence Committee. You voted to release this memo. I assume that means you think the president should comply as well. Absolutely. I voted to make this memo available to the House and then, of course, support its release to the public. Uh, there is very detailed information in this memo that I think the public needs to understand. Certainly the House needs to review as we look to legislative uh, remedies to uh, you know, try to address the abuses that the memo outlines. But the president, now that he has this before him, I think it's very clear I'm reading this memo and hopefully you'll be able to read it soon also. There is no threat to national security for the public seeing this memo. It details abuses that need to be addressed 
addressed, and this certainly is something that, that the public and certainly Congress need to debate. Some have who have observed or listened to the president's exchange uh, with Congressman Jeff Duncan last night said he appeared to be facetious in saying that he wants to release it. Do you, do you have any way of knowing what the president's take is? I wouldn't want to speculate what the president's take is, but I can tell you this, having read the memo and support its release. The memo itself has no information in it that is going to disrupt investigations or uh, challenge national security, other than bringing to light abuses that need to be addressed. These are abuses that both the American public need to be aware of and Congress needs to take action for. I think when the president reviews, it, reviews this, he'll see it the same way and hopefully he'll release it to the public. Well, you answered a question there that I didn't ask because many critics have said that this is going to release sources and methods of intelligence gathering, you don't think that's going to be the case? Absolutely not. I mean, when you, it, it's specific actions of abuses, and I think that needs to be brought to light. And when people finally do get the opportunity, hopefully with the president's approval to read this memo, all the critics of this are going to look pretty foolish for some of the speculations that they've made and some of the accusations they've made that are just absolutely false. And when we look forward to the release of that memo, we hope it's going to come in the next uh, few days. The president, uh, in the meantime, was also touching on the threat from North Korea last night. Here's part of what he had to say. Past experience has taught us that complacency and concessions only invite aggression and provocation. I will not repeat the mistakes of past administrations that got us into this very dangerous position. We need only look at the depraved character of the North Korean regime to understand the nature of the nuclear threat it could pose to America and to our allies. What's your response, Congressman, to the way the president characterized the North Korea situation? He's absolutely accurate. And he made the case last night for increased defense spending. We have cut our defense budget to the extent that we've disadvantaged our men and women in uniform and our capabilities. He talked about our near peer competitors, also China and Russia, and their modernization and their future threat to peace. And then by focusing on North Korea, and especially bringing to light the issue of the last two administrations, because literally for 10 years, we've had two administrations that have watched North Korea pursue nuclear weapons and the ability uh, to hold our homeland uh, hostage and to attack our homeland. And uh, this needs to be addressed. This president is going to be doing that by increasing our military spending, making us strong. He said it straight up in his speech. The only way that we can ensure, ensure peace is by making certain that the United States is strong. Congressman Mike Turner, a Republican from Ohio. It's good to have you on Happening Now. Thank I'll you, sir. You Thank you. Thank you. A false alert about an incoming ballistic missile caused a panic in Hawaii nearly three weeks ago. Today, new information about what actually happened, what we know about the employee who sent it out. Plus, more reaction to President Trump's State of the Union address. Next, we're going to hear from Deputy White House Press Secretary Raj Shah. No people on earth are so fearless or daring or determined as Americans. If there is a mountain, we climb it. If there's a frontier, we cross it. If there's a challenge, we tame it. If there's an opportunity, we seize it. Panic across Hawaii nearly three weeks ago. Federal officials now say the employee who sent it out told them he believed it was a real emergency and has since been fired. Two other top officials also have left the state agency. One employee resigned before any disciplinary action was taken. We're in the process of suspending one employee without pay. And finally, after numerous discussions over the past two weeks, a respected military leader, an honorable man, has taken full responsibility for the incident of January the 13th and the actions of all his employees. Adam Housley is on that story and joins us now live with more. Adam? 
Yeah, John, a lot of details coming out. In fact, they still haven't named the ex-employee who no longer now works at that agency um, that set this all off back on uh, January 13th when he or she set off the uh, false alarm, if you will, had people uh, come on their cell phones saying that there was a ballistic missile threat and that some people were putting their kids down storm drains because of it. Um, we also learned during this press conference that a change of um, shift was taking place among many other mistakes. Also, according to officials, the uh, fired slash resigned employee took full responsibility but some of his co-workers have said that the same employee has been a source of concern before and confused real-life events for drills several times in the past. In fact, a federal report released uh, found that the employee believed it was a real uh, actual missile uh, launch, even though at the beginning it said exercise, 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 and at the end, of course, it said this is not a drill. He has performance issues, and throughout the 10 years, he has confused drills at at least two times, uh, a real-world drill and, and a practice drill. As we now know, of course, it wasn't just the fact that a warning went out wrong. We also know that it took about 38 minutes to retract it, and because there was, a, there was three or four different steps that employees then had to take to basically right the wrong that was done by one individual. We know a couple of other things too, John. First of all, that there were three supervisors on at that time. All were out in the hallway when this took place. A number of changes are going to be put into effect. Some have already started. In fact, one, they say, which is, sounds pretty simple, it will now take two employees, one and another one to over the, look over the shoulder to send out one of those alerts. So you won't have the situation may not have heard it, now two would have to not hear it. John? Seems yeah. logical. Let's hope we don't see that kind of panic again. Adam Housley. Adam, Absolutely. Thank you. All right. President Trump urging bipartisanship in last night's State of the Union address while also celebrating America's successes and strengths in the face of adversity this past year. Over the last year, we have made incredible progress and achieved extraordinary success. We have faced challenges we expected and others we could never have imagined. We have shared in the heights of victory and the pains of hardship. We have endured floods and fires and storms. But through it all, we have seen the beauty of America's soul and the steel in America's spine. Each test has forged new American heroes to remind us who we are and show us what we can be. But of course, the speech being met with mixed reaction. We're hearing from the White House now. Principal Deputy Press Secretary Raj Shah joining me live from the North Lawn. Thank you so much for joining us. There, there was a lot of emotion in last night's speech. Obviously, a lot of people standing up and cheering, you know, the panning out to the crowd and, and seeing the people that were being honored. Talking about the policy, though, there was something for everyone to love and something for everyone to hate. If When he talks about creating paid family leave, keeping Gitmo open, making an the new nuclear arsenal stronger, um, prescription drugs less expensive, cracking down on drug dealers. The, you know, there's something for each side. Have you guys gotten any pushback today from people even on the right who didn't like some of the elements? Well, Melissa, thanks a lot for uh, having me on. Yeah, you did tick off a lot of the issues, and the president really offered uh, a unifying address last night. There was something for everyone to embrace. Uh, he talked about how the economy is growing, growing rapidly now. We have unemployment at a near two-decade low. Uh, we have the stock market rising. The president has a big agenda going forward on issues like immigration, infrastructure. And, uh, of course, there's going to be some pushback. Uh, this is Democratic president giving a Democratic City Union address. This president, though, is uh, committed to unifying the country, bringing us forward, working with Democrats and Republicans on an agenda that the American people first and foremost want. Well, even on the Republican side, I mean, when when you know the, most of the chamber cheered for paid family leave, you notice Speaker Speaker Ryan didn't stand up and cheer. So you know, it's it's one of those things where he, if even if you looked at the policy within it, there was something for each side. Um, you know, one of the the big concerns, I think, from the right is that he let the positive aura continue and not step on himself tweeting or something else coming out. Has there been any conversation about that within the White House? Because we, we haven't seen a lot of activity on the Twitter. 
Well, it's uh, unique when the president gets an opportunity to speak uh, directly to the American people for over an hour, as he did last night. I talked about some of the themes. You talked about paid family leave. His message to American families was pretty clear. Uh, if you work hard, uh, you should have an opportunity to raise children uh, that live up to and uh, embrace the American dream. They should have uh, educational opportunities, job opportunities, and we should give you, um, you know, an opportunity to raise them uh, with as much support as possible. That's why the president signed into a law a uh, tax cut bill that passed uh, last year uh, that has a child tax credit that doubles a child tax credit makes it easier to raise a family so uh, on many issues he's reaching across the aisle he wants to work with democrats and republicans and we think the president's remarks were so successful we'll let them speak for themselves yeah well um you know speaker pelosi wasn't that excited uh, i'm sorry uh, <laughs> minority leader pelosi yeah. wasn't that excited <laughs> let's not make that uh, mistake yeah, sorry pardon me um she <laughs> said tonight the president presented a self congratulatory speech without vision he promised unity but he sowed division Americans deserve better she might have written that the night before real quick you know frankly you know there was so much that Democrats could get behind but they refused to do it uh, the president talked about how African Americans and Hispanic Americans are facing some of the lowest unemployment rates mm -hmm. in recorded history in this country's history and you had the Congressional Black Caucus and Nancy Pelosi and others sit on their hands I mean I don't know what you can clap about if you can't clap about that so yeah. the president offered an olive branch he's going to work with them and willing to work with them on issues like infrastructure immigration and many others yeah. um, we want a safe stronger and prouder America we want to work with Democrats to do that but they have to meet us halfway yeah and she's talking through a lot of the speech too I noticed thank of you for course. coming on Shah. we appreciate your time thanks so much for having me a Fox News alert, and we do not have a lot of information about this, but we understand that a train carrying Republican members of Congress who were headed to their uh, post uh, State of the Union retreat at the Greenbrier Resort in West Virginia, that train has had some kind of an accident. Now, we are told that most of the people on board appear to be okay, but there are some injuries. We don't have any information, frankly, about what kind of an accident this was. Whether the uh, uh, cars left the tracks or not, we do not know. Could have been a collision with, with a car or a truck at an intersection. Uh, the Greenbrier in the mountains of West Virginia, pretty hilly area, obviously. Yeah. And so where exactly this thing uh, had its, its uh, accident is going to be an important point to note. But again, Republican members of Congress who had boarded a train to head for the Greenbrier Resort for their annual retreat where they were going to talk about things like the 20 ele 2018 election landscape. That train has had some kind of an accident and we're told there are injuries. Uh, we will continue to bring you um, the latest information on this story as it comes into the Fox Newsroom. In the meantime, President Trump's State of the Union address drawing criticism from many Democrats and praise from his supporters. Next, our panel weighs in on the highs and lows of last night. Breaking news for you right now. We want to tell you about an Amtrak train um, that was taking GOP members to a retreat in West Virginia in Greenbrier that has been involved in a collision. GOP sources are saying that the train collided with a dump truck which was on the tracks at the time and that this accident took place near Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, we are also getting word right now, as we said, it was a special charter taking those members after the State of the Union. They were going to have a retreat to talk about strategy in light of last night and coming into the 2018. Um, more reports that it appears the train collided with a dump truck, which may have been stuck on the tracks at the time. And there may be injuries to the dump truck driver. We're also hearing scanner reports that there is a triage center being set up right near where the accident was. Looking on Twitter, um, Congressman Don Bacon tweeting minutes ago, I am on the train, but I'm okay, John. The Greenbrier is a legendary retreat there in the mountains of West Virginia in White Sulphur Springs. In fact, it is the, the place where the federal government opted to build a sort of an emergency um, convening center for the U.S. government. Back in the Cold War days, there are subterranean chambers there uh, where the, ho the houses of Congress have room to be able to meet. Uh, this was all done uh, in case of nuclear attack by the then Soviet Union. Those facil facilities at the Greenbrier still exist. 
um, the members of Congress, the Republican members of Congress, uh, chartered this special Amtrak train that was to take them there for several days of meetings uh, to talk about especially the sort of potentially rocky landscape for Republicans come November of 2018. President Trump is among those who was supposed to uh, go there and meet them. And, and now we're getting some of the first pictures via Twitter um, of what happened when this Amtrak train, specially chartered by members of the Republican caucus of the House and Senate, uh, when that train apparently hit a dump truck near Charlottesville, Virginia. That's amazing. I didn't know that about Greenbrier. You actually knew that before this happened. Um, some other tweets that we're seeing. This is from um, Kansas Republican Congressman Dr. Roger Marshall saying we are on our way to our annual GOP retreat. The train carrying members and spouses hit something. Lena and I are OK. I'm helping those that are injured. I will keep you updated as we know more. So we're seeing some things come out on Twitter right now from those who are involved. And this is one of the first pictures that is uh, coming in. There is actually a train stop at the resort. So this is this is something that had been in the works for a while. And it's hard to make out that picture. What can it, you see it, it there, It sure John? looks like a train car. And if so, it is badly crumbled. And that, that uh, uh, puts a whole different level of concern about what might have happened to those mm -hmm. on board. We are told that, that there are injuries, uh, but we don't know the extent of the injuries. Our Chad Pergram, He's joining us now by phone. He covers Congress for us and uh, does an excellent job doing so. Chad, what are you hearing? I'm hearing that this uh, train accident happened uh, near Crozet, Virginia. Crozet, Virginia, which is west of Charlottesville. Again, they, they took this special train leaving early this morning, bound for uh, the Greenbrier and White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia, for the annual retreat. The president was supposed to speak to the Republican members tomorrow. Mike Pence, the vice president, tonight. I am told by senior sources here on Capitol Hill that the locomotive hit what appeared to be a trash truck, and the locomotive has derailed, but no indi indication that any of the other cars on this train, and we don't know the size of the train that they derailed. I am told that members uh, were thrown from their seats and hit the deck. Uh, we're getting very sketchy, fragmentary information here about injuries. Uh, we're told uh, that, that they don't appear to be major at this point. Uh, keep in mind that a lot of members take their spouses on this uh, on this trip as well, and so we don't know the extent of injuries there. But this happened near Crozet, Virginia, and again, this is a special train where they packed up buses, took members of Congress, Republicans going to their retreat from the House side of the Capitol over to Union Station, which is just about a quarter mile across uh, Capitol Hill, boarded this train early this morning bound for the Greenbrier in West Virginia. Chad, do you have any idea how long ago this accident happened? That's something we're trying to get as well, because, you know, they 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 left, uh, you know, pretty early this morning. You know, it's quite a, an enterprise to get people uh, packed up and they take the buses over and then, you know, get them on the train. We think the train left around eight o'clock this morning here. Uh, now, I am told in just the past couple of minutes, and I've gotten this from three different sources, that the biggest concern about an injury appears to be the driver of the truck and that his injuries may be life threatening. That has come from multiple sources and we believe, at least in the early fragments,